to my channel where today I'm going to be speaking about the male principle and the king. But before we begin, I'd like to go over a few points I made in the last video about the female principle because they also apply here. First, that the entire temple teaching is encoded in a symbolic language which is based on natural law, that is, cosmic law or the netters. Second, how the hermetic principle as above so below reminds us of the metaphysical and the physical levels and how myth relates the two together. And finally, how Ra created both the netters and almost every living creature, either male or female, and the difference between the two is most clearly revealed in their genitals. Now you may be wondering why I stress this point, but we're touching upon one of the great fundamental laws here, the scission of the divine unity into duality, which is the cause of the division of male and female and all other polar opposites. It's a huge factor that affects the whole of creation and by applying the precept as below, so above, these seemingly small details can explain a great many things on the metaphysical level. Because the netters are the creative forces that brought the creation into being. And likewise, the genitals are what procreates the life of each species, which is their vital function. And these vital organs were formed such that the male member is external and visible, while the female is internal and therefore hidden or concealed. However, during their sacred union, the female contains the male, while the male is contained by the female. You will find this same principle of duality expressed in all the great teachings, through symbols like the Buddhist yin and yang, or the Hindu yoni and linga, which, by the way, throws a completely new light on what Egyptologists call offering tables, and I'll be speaking about them in another video. So how do we apply these principles here on earth? And just who is the king? Well, for years I've been telling people that you are the king. And when you see this image in a relief or a sculpture, it represents you or more exactly, the Horus principle within you, which is already present and illuminated. It's your third eye in service to God. It just needs to be activated, which is what the temple teaching is all about. That's why in every scene, in every temple, it's the king, it's the king, it's the king. Always different netters, different things being exchanged, but it's always the king. Because that image of the king is the most perfect and complete expression of the male principle on the physical realm. It's the figure we commonly call Pharaoh, which comes from the Egyptian term per a, but it needs some investigation. The word is written with two hieroglyphs, a plan view of an enclosure with an opening, and a long shape with a stylized hotep symbol at one end, which represents the male principle, and more on that in the next video. Anyway, it's interpreted as meaning large or great, so per a is usually translated as the great house. But prior to the new kingdom, it did not refer to a person. However, during the 18th dynasty, it was specifically applied to the king. Note that here in Egypt, what we call Sufis are not familiar with that term. They call themselves al al -Bayt, which translates as people or family of the house, that is, belonging to the family or great house of the Prophet Muhammad. It's my understanding that the Pharaoh or Per A refers to anyone who has activated the Horus principle within themselves 
or in more modern language, who has become illuminated or awakened. Therefore, it referred collectively to all of the enlightened members of the temple teaching at any given time. And to complete the symbolic picture, there was one individual who was chosen to represent this principle, and he acted as the king, literally a personification of the male principle in human form. This is where the true meaning of ritual applies, because it's the crossover or meeting point of the physical and metaphysical worlds. Horus represents cosmic consciousness, which is a metaphysical principle, yet the king is a human being. And as we saw with Hatshepsut, the king does not have to be a man, it can be a woman also. The Horus principle acts the same within him or her. So now let's look at how this principle comes into being. And for that we need to go back to the passion play of Osiris. In the myth, the body of Osiris has been hacked to pieces that were scattered throughout Egypt. Then Isis and Nephthys gathered them all together, and through her magic, Isis reassembled them. However, one significant detail was that his phallus was missing, since it had fallen into the Nile and been eaten by a fish. Okay. So even though Isis had magically reassembled his body, the one thing needed to conceive a child was his genital, and so she had to make one herself. You see how well myth uses simple human terms to explain big metaphysical ideas. Because what it makes clear is that the fusion of male and female required to bring cosmic consciousness into being is not gender related. It's a completely metaphysical union that produces the Horus child, the third eye, or whatever you want to call it. Coming back to the male principle being that which is contained, Horus, whose original name is Hor, took a wife named Hathor, and the hieroglyph for her name explains everything. Hat is another plan of an enclosed space, yet while the pur had an opening or door, this is a total enclosure that contains the image of Horus. In the Sufi teaching, which closely follows the ancient Egyptian, the pearl of great price, your cosmic consciousness, is contained within the sir, or secret heart, which on the physical realm corresponds to the pineal gland. It is the throne upon which that consciousness is held. So with Hathor as the home where Horus dwells, who played that role to the king? Our word queen was not used until the medieval times, referring to a king's wife. But the original Egyptian title looked like this. Scholars translate this title as the Great Royal Wife, or more commonly, the Queen. However, since we're so conditioned by European kings and queens, I prefer to translate it as the safeguard or protector of the royal principle. And in their symbolic language, she is often shown on a much smaller scale, standing with her arm around the king's leg. Again, this has nothing to do with men or women, but refers to metaphysical principles. As we saw, the roles of both pharaoh and king are not gender related and can be played by either a man or a woman. But this role must be played by a woman. So even when Hatshepsut became king, her daughter took on this title. So remember that the king refers to the seed of your own cosmic consciousness. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this mystical journey today. And when you want to join me on further adventures, hit the like and subscribe buttons. 
and you may consider supporting the channel by buying me a coffee through the link below. And thank you for watching.